James chapter 5 is where we're going. Uh, we got a few more weeks in the By My Spirit uh, series, and I had intentions, y'all, of talking about praying in the Spirit and what that means because we see it several times, pray in the Spirit, pray in the Holy Ghost, and it is at the bottom of your outline, but I'm well aware I'm not getting to it today. Uh, I just started building some things on what prayer is like and some practical things, and uh, we're going to have to spill over into next week. So I'm aware, don't get nervous if the outline isn't moving fast enough as I preach today. James chapter 5, would you stand for the reading of God's Word? That means a lot to me, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Beginning in verse 16, the last part of verse 16. Um, And by the way, prayer night Tuesday. Tuesday night's a special prayer night. We're, we're going to call it the, the extended version. Uh, so we're not going to get out at 7 on purpose. Uh, we've got personal prayer time. And we're going to have some worship. And then we're going to be in the altar seeking for the Lord to do what he wants to do. And, uh, I mean, I don't plan on being here at 10 o'clock. But we want the Lord to have room and time to do anything he wants to do. So I thought I'd mention that as well. That's this Tuesday. And then James says, The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. We pray together, Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you for everybody that's here. Lord, I thank you for people who are shoulder to shoulder in this room. They just defy the the statistics that say people won't sit shoulder to shoulder. And here we are, and I thank you for the people in the overflow, Lord. I pray somehow you reach through the TVs and you speak to their hearts right where they're at, as you do online. May we be nudged toward prayer, be moved to come to you more often, and Father, just believe that you can do the impossible in our lives. And may our prayers be an integral part of that, is is my request today. May distractions be brought to nothing, and your word have our full attention. In the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. You may be seated. Thank you. I've read, I, I believe it's true, that prayer is the most underutilized privilege of the Christian life. I don't know how many students go to seminary to study like crazy for a theology degree and they come out of school with a degree but they're very anemic when it comes to praying it would be scary to know how many pastors are standing behind the sacred desk on Sundays they've got something to say but they have not spent time in the presence of the Lord before they said it or how many minutes the average church going person spends in a week before the Lord's presence And all that to say, I'm not trying to come today. I know that, you know, I can step on toes and my presentation is sometimes a little raw. And my goal today is really not for you to walk away saying, man, I'm I'm terrible. I don't pray enough. My goal is really to answer some, some practical things to where maybe it's not that we don't care about prayer. Maybe we feel like we're not good at it. Maybe we feel like, don't feel like we know how to do it too well. And if we can just have some practical measures, some practical things that will make our life more fulfilling and more effective, maybe we'll get there. So that's my goal. So in your outline, let's start with, first of all, not all prayers are created equal. We have different prayers that we pray, the prayer of consecration, prayer of repentance, prayer of salvation, prayer for healing, prayer for submission, prayer for wisdom, prayer for for guidance, prayer for peace, uh, the prayer of agreement, praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues. There's all kind of different prayers we read about in Scripture. And they're, they're, they're all, a lot of them are great. Some of them are bad examples. There's a Pharisee who was praying, and he was arrogant, saying, I'm glad I ain't like these sinners. That's not an effective prayer. The, the, the sinner beside him saying, Lord, have mercy, had a more effective prayer than the, than the religious dude who should know how to pray. So it's not always the guys who look like they know what they're doing that's praying the most effective prayers. And there's a difference between praying over your chicken here when you leave and praying over your child to be healed. That's a different prayer, that you go at it differently. And and with that in mind, we read James 5, and it's very encouraging because it starts out saying, Elijah was a human being just like us. Another verse says, he's a man just like us. If I can bring it down to today's vernacular, he's just a dude. He's just a guy. He's not a superhero. 
Elijah's not cloaked in deity. He's just a guy. And James wanted to be crystal clear before he tells you how powerful his prayer was. He wants you to know he's just a guy. Puts his pants on one leg at a time. Or maybe it was a robe back then. Either way, you know my point. He's just like us. And yet he prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed that it would rain again and it began, it began raining again after he prayed. And we sit back and we go, wow, that's a mighty man of God. And certainly he was a mighty man of God. But it starts with the preface. He was a man just like us, just like Chris, just like Chase. He was a man just like Brendan. He's a man. And yet he prayed and God answered prayer in a powerful way. So maybe there's something we can tap into to make our prayers more effective. The effective prayer of a righteous person avails much. So next in your outline, I want you to know as an individual, you can have prayers that avail much. You can have a prayer that touches heaven. You can have a prayer that results in a miracle. I just want to throw this out there. We've got the demographic uh, blitz of all kind of demographics in here. There's teenagers in the room. You need to hear this. God can answer the prayer of a 14-year-old as much as he can a 49-year-old. This is not an adult sermon. This is a sermon for all of God's sons and daughters to know that they can approach the throne room of grace and talk to an omnipotent, sovereign God who hears them when they cry out and who can answer their prayers in powerful ways. You don't need a seminary degree, a seminary degree to have a powerful prayer life. The prayers of a righteous person. And I hear somebody say, well, that's it right there. I'm not righteous. What do you mean you're not righteous? Because you messed up this week? That's not what righteousness means. What do you mean you're not righteous? You're, you're not perfect? Okay, well, step in line. What makes us righteous? Somebody help me preach. The blood of Jesus makes us righteous. Our righteousness was imputed or credited to our account because of Jesus, not because I was good enough. So I am a righteous person. You are a righteous person, not because you're all that, but because he's all that, and he traded your nothingness with his all thatness, and he gave you righteousness. That's why you're righteous, so your prayers can be powerful and effective. Well, if that's the case, how should we pray? And here's where I got practical. I was like, well, maybe not everybody knows these things. To me, I, it's, I've grown up in this. And, you know, so there's, there's something uh, they call the curse of knowledge. Have you ever heard the curse of knowledge? And you begin to think because you know it, everybody knows it. And I'm probably guilty of that, you know? I, I say dumb things like, you know what Isaiah 40 says? And most of people, Isaiah, Isaiah what? So I'm, I'm, I want to break prayer down and just... These simple questions that may not have answers to everybody in the room. The first question is, to whom do I pray? Who am I talking to when I pray? And I know we have many different walks of faith here. You have many different backgrounds. And I'm not trying to offend or rattle the cage of Catholics. We have Catholic people that were, we were raised Catholic. They've come into faith. They've come into the church. I believe there are saved Catholics. I'm not against the cat. Okay, just breathe. But in, just let me present this and just say, there is no scriptural evidence or precedent to where we pray to saints. There's nothing in the scripture about us praying to saints. And there's nothing in scripture that says saints are, have a responsibility to pray for us. It's not in the book. There's no obligation or responsibility of anybody who's gone on to be in heaven of the Lord to pray for us. I'm, I'm not saying they ain't. I'm just saying there's nothing in the Bible that says they are. So I'm glad my dad's there, and I'm sure if my dad knows what's going on here and he has the opportunity, he's going to put in a good word for me. But I can't bank on that. There's nothing in the script. This, this is something that started in the 3rd or 4th century when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And that's when all this began. They began to pray to saints. Are saints alive? Yeah, they're alive in the spirit. Are they part of the kingdom? Yes, they're part of the kingdom. There's just nothing in here saying they're praying for me. So with that in mind... And there's nothing in there saying that we should pray to them. And even though there's nothing in there saying saints are praying for us, we do have evidence that somebody's praying for us in heaven. Two places the Bible says that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God and he lives to make intercession for me and you. He exists to whisper in the right, into the right ear of the Father your name and to plead on your behalf 
when you're having a bad day, he's not ready to punch you in the mouth. He's praying for you that God's mercy will pour all over you. That's what the Bible says. Somebody's praying for us, but it ain't my, my dead grandma. It's a living Jesus who's praying on my behalf. So I'm not praying to mama or saint whoever, but I'm praying to Jesus who said he was praying for me. Actually, here's what Jesus said we should do in Matthew 6, 9. When you pray, pray to the Father. Our Father in heaven is how we pray. Who are we praying to? We're praying to the omnipotent, the sovereign, the omniscient, the creator, the one to whom there is nothing impossible, to the one who has no degree of difficulty. That's who we're praying to. And he's not this God who's just a superpower. He's a father to his children. So now I'm praying to somebody who's super powerful, and yet he loves me like a father. Doesn't that make a difference when we go in prayer? Now I'm not only praying to somebody who can answer my greatest needs, but he loves me so much he wants to answer my greatest needs. That's who I'm praying to. Our Father who art in heaven. And then Jesus gives us another little nugget, and he says, not only do you pray to our Father. Now, as I say that, there's nothing wrong with praying to Jesus or praying to the Holy Spirit. They're all one. They're all together. I think a lot of people neglect the Holy Spirit anyway, so I think he would enjoy you praying every now and then, saying, Holy Spirit, I bless you. They're all the same God. But I lean to starting my prayers with Father. Just I believe that's the pattern. And then Jesus in John 16 says, when you do that, here's what I want to add. You will ask who directly? Ask the Father directly. Don't need to go through a man. Don't need to go through a pastor. Don't need to go through a saint. I go to the Father directly. That's what the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus did on the cross. A veil that separated the presence of God from everybody else was ripped so that more than one person once a year could go into his presence. All God's children could go into his presence. So we go to the Father directly, and he will grant what you're asking for in prayer because you use my name. Now when I'm talking to the Father, I'm talking to the Father in Jesus' name if you've ever heard about it, somebody close out the prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. It's not a churchy thing. It's a scripture thing. And the legal term is power of attorney. And a lot of you are familiar with power of attorney. It just simply means somebody has the right to sign a name or use your name when you're not in the room. It's not just when somebody's incapacitated on their deathbed. The power of attorney is when somebody says, I can't be in the room, but I'm going to send you as my delegate with the same authority as if I was in the room. Jesus said, I go away because if I don't go away, I can't send the Holy Spirit to you. So I'm not going to be in the room physically. I can't reach out and touch somebody sick like I have been when, I'm around, when I was around a minute ago. I'm going away, so when I go away, you can use my name. <laughs> and when you use my name, it'll be like my authority is in the room with you. Hallelujah. So we're talking to a father who loves us, a father who knows no degrees of difficulty, and then we're not coming to him on our identity or on our worthiness, but on the name of Jesus and his identity and worthiness. And it's a setup, y'all. It's a setup. And the odds are in our favor on this thing. We go to our father in Jesus' name. That's who we should pray to. Okay, well, do I pray out loud? Or in my head? Good question. Now, it could be either way. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to jar this service right here. This is the most uh, motley myriad of faith backgrounds we got. First service, I can't go into it. Anyway, this is, we're all just a jumbled, jumbled group of people in this service. You know what I'm saying? Y'all from everywhere. So there's a lot of you who'd like to pray to yourself. You just want to pray in your head. And you know what? God is so awesome, he can hear your thoughts. And you can pray in your head. And that way you don't look like an idiot, you know, on an airplane. When, you, when you're praying, God, please, you, let, let the angels lay this thing down. And you, you know, you can do that in your head, and not everybody knows you're scared as can be. So that's a cool thing. It's cool that God says he knows our anxious thoughts. It's cool that God says before a word forms on your lips, he knew them fully all together. So certainly you can pray in your head. But may I make a case for praying out loud, please? It's not just a Pentecostal thing. I mean, we do it better than any of them. You know what I'm saying? We go at it loud. You know, everybody that makes fun of the Pentecostal say, well, God ain't deaf. 
you don't need to get that loud. And then Pentecost will say back, well, he ain't nervous either. I ain't going to scare him. So, you know, we just go like that. You, the five people clapping are, they're bleeding Pentecostal blue. You know what I'm saying? They are born and bred in it. Why pray out loud? Well, Jesus told his disciples, say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and it will be done for you. If you don't doubt in your heart you, uh, that what you prayed for will happen. And Jesus is teaching, we need to stop complaining about our mountains and start talking to them. Amen. Stop complaining about our problems and start speaking to the problems. You say, well, um, a, a mountain can't hear. Neither can a fig tree. A fig tree doesn't have ears either, but Jesus walked by one that didn't have any fruit, and he spoke to the fig tree and said, you are cursed and may nobody eat from you again. He said it out loud because he needed the fig tree to hear it, and we know he said it out loud because the disciples heard it. Because the next day when they walked by, the disciples were like mind blown. The fig tree's cursed. How do they know? They said, how did that happen? They heard Jesus curse it. And there comes a point when things you need to hear, things that you want to hear, bye, 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 things that need to hear you praying can only hear it if you say it out loud. How about the enemy? Now, I love the fact that he can't read my thoughts. I'm so glad he's not in my head. Some of you are, he's in my head. No, no. I know you're maybe thinking thoughts that he would love, but he's not in your head. He's not like God. He doesn't know everything. God knows your thoughts. Satan does not. So it's a beautiful thing. You could be praying, uh, you could be praying in your head about doubts. You don't want the enemy to hear that. And that's great. That's fine. But there are times when we go into battle in prayer when you're praying against the enemy himself. You're praying against strongholds and you're praying against oppression and you're praying against darkness and if I may even say it, demonic activity. And in those moments, praying in your head is doing nothing. Okay, y'all, I, 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 hear, I hear you are. Here's the Motley crew coming at me right here. Okay, first of all, I don't look for a demon everywhere, okay? Flat tire's not a demon. Uh, devil's after me today, I had a flat tire. Are you sure you just didn't run over a nail? That's my question. I mean, could it be a nail instead of a demon? I think it was a nail. I'm sure how Pentecostal we were. If the sound, if the sound system started going out, the devil. Come on, pray against the devil trying to stop this server. We, we'd do it. We'd shut it all down. In the name of Jesus, you know, we'd pray over anything. Now, to their defense... Uh, my family has prayed over washing machines that stopped working, and they've started working again. So, you know, I don't, I don't know if the devil was in it or not, but the Lord did them. Some of y'all are like, can y'all pray over my car? Can somebody come pray over my car right now? I am lost. Where, okay, so I'm saying I don't look for a demon everywhere, but I do know that suicidal tendencies are not of this world. That's not normal. I know addictions are windows to evil spirit activity. I know that there is demonic attacks in this world. People don't want to believe it, but it's happening. And if I'm going to come against the enemy and it's the enemy's activity, he needs to hear me. He can't read my thoughts, so I can't say in my head, the Lord rebuke you. He needs to hear come out of my mouth. I see you. I'm exposing you. I know it's you. And the Lord rebuke you, Satan. He needs to hear that. Now, Again, I'm going against my raising here. We were taught, rebuke the devil. We're going around rebuking everything. I rebuke you, devil. I frankly don't want the devil to even know my name. I don't want to be Job. I want to be low on his totem pole. I want to be lower on the list when he's coming after people. You know what I'm saying? And some of you are like, well, that doesn't sound too holy. Well, you go ahead and get on this hit list. All you want, climb the ladder, baby. I want to be right here in the middle. Not, you know, I don't want him to come after me. But he's coming. I know he is. But my point is this, even though I'm not looking for him, I'm not going to run from him. And when I'm addressing him, we were taught, rebuke the devil. I think I'm going to go with what the archangel Michael did in Jude. Archangel, top dog Michael, said, he didn't say, I rebuke you. He said, the Lord himself rebuke you. Yeah. And you see, when you take your authority in him, now you got something. Don't go rebuking nothing. You ain't nothing. All right? He will whip. But you go in Jesus' name and say, the Lord himself rebuke you.
The Lord himself rebuke you off of my child. The Lord himself rebuke you out of her mind. The Lord himself break the chains of addiction. The Lord himself lift the darkness off of you. May the Lord do it, but you've got to speak that. Speak it out loud. And I say that because when we have prayer time in this service, it's almost like a funeral. It's quiet. I'm like, prayer time, y'all. And if I were to ask you, say, well, this is how I pray. Nothing wrong with it. But come on, y'all. We, we, we uh, when we have small groups every now and then, I don't know, people come in for different walks, right? And I said, hey, everybody, let's pray. And we start praying. And there's like two people. When everybody starts praying, you can, they're like no closing. They're looking around like, why is it? They said, why is everybody praying? Because we're all praying. I thought one person was supposed to pray and everybody else listens. Where did you hear that? We think God's pretty awesome that he can hear all of us at the same time. You know, there's nothing wrong with one person praying and the rest of us agree. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm just saying. That, let's go. And let, man, I, I want to get the men. Why is it I hear a lot of women praying sometimes? I don't hear the masculine testosterone, who, oh, oh, who, men praying. The priest of our homes, the kingpin of a last day outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it needs to be on the men. And I know you, you macho, I get you. You got muscles on your muscles. I know you could, you could hit a fly from 500 meters if you have the right scope. I get it. And that's what bothers me about the laxness of your spirituality. If an intruder were on your porch about to break in your house, I know you. You'd get dog nasty and you'd get loud. You'd get the weapon out, whether it's a ball bat or a Glock. You'd have something in your hand and you wouldn't think in your head what you're going to do to him. You say, boy, if you don't get off my porch, I'm going to show you whose door you just walked on. I'm going to put you six feet under. You'll be doing all this right here. You'll be walking gangsta on them. Why? Because you're the man. Why is it when the enemy is attacking your house? Why is it that the enemy is trying to do damage to your children or your marriage? You don't man up and get loud about the enemy's attack. Where are the men leading this thing? Pray out loud. I don't know what to say. When you ain't got nothing else to say, just speak the name Jesus. Plead the blood of Jesus. Satan, the Lord himself, rebuke you. Well, praise the Lord. That didn't go. Okay, so another reason we pray out loud, for me, it helps because I get distracted easy when I try to pray. Is anybody else ADHD besides me? I was ADHD. I was now undiagnosed, mind you. Uh, they didn't have Ritalin back in the 70s, so I didn't take Ritalin, but I had a red rear end a lot. <laughs> but it doesn't leave you. you. It's still with me, very much so. You can tell when I'm preaching, I see somebody I haven't seen, I'll say, oh, hey, how you doing? I'm pre preaching right here, talking to somebody. I've been sick. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, if I go to pray, it's bad by itself, but if I go to praying, it's almost like it, it jumps on steroids. I'll be sincerely praying for one of you. I'm like, God, would you help them through the surgery they're going on? And 15 seconds, I'm thinking about cutting my grass. <laughs> now I look out the window and my shrubs are dying. I'm like, my shrubs are dying. Five minutes later, I'm, I'm supposed to be praying. What's going on right here? Why? Because if all I'm doing is thinking in my head, I just go from rabbit trail to rabbit trail. But when I start saying, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for Danny Moat today. A calling is on his life. He's trying to pursue it with all he's got. And my prayer is that no weapon formed against him will prosper. My prayer is doors will open up for him that he hadn't even thought of yet. I pray that you strengthen his wife to be the partner she wants to be, to strengthen that ministry. I haven't thought of another thought yet because I'm praying out loud instead of just thinking in my head. And there's a powerful thing when we're praying out loud. You, you enter a room where there's a roar of intercession. I can't explain it other than it's powerful. Well, okay. Do I pray boldly or do I pray humbly? You got to be careful on this one because the answer is yes to both, but I would rather lean into humbly, big. Humbly go before the Lord. Why? Because one, think of who he is, and two, think of who you are. He's all that, and you're not. 
He's perfect in all his ways. And you're not. He's holy and righteous and omnipotent. And you're not. Jars of clay is what the Apostle Paul called you. You're just a vessel made of dirt. Your next breath is a gift of the grace of God. That's who you are. And you're going before the Almighty. I don't see how you can have a strut walking into the presence of the Lord. There's no swagger in the presence of the Almighty. You may be all that around here, but let me tell you, you get a glimpse of him and his glory, on judgment day, there will be no swagger. There will be no hubris coming out of your mouth. You will see as he is, and you will see yourself for who you are. I highly suggest that happens before judgment day. So humbly, the high priest, when he went to the Holy of Holies, you know that one time a year, one day a year, he went in there. Some of you may not know this. He had bells on the bottom of his robe. And a, and a rope tied around his ankle. Y'all know why? So that they could hear activity outside of the Holy of Holies. If they heard the bells jingling, they said, he's all right. Because if he made one error against God's written, detailed process, he would drop dead in the presence of the Almighty. And ain't nobody going in to get Larry after that. <laughs> so they got a rope and they said, drag him out, boys. We don't hear something. Drop, ain't nobody going in there. You think you're going to walk into the presence of the Lord with your strut? You, you think that's your way you're walking into the Holy of Holies? Nah. Humble. If it wasn't for the grace of God, where would I be? I have nothing to boast about in the presence of the Almighty. So anytime I go into prayer, it's humbly, right? And yet, there's, there is a thing of confidence in prayer. Hebrews 4.16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. One version actually says, go into the throne room of grace with boldness or boldly. So what does that mean? How can I walk in there humbly and boldly? Do you have a four-year-old youngin' around you or a grand youngin'? Raise your hand if you do. There's confidence in them, right? They walk right into your, they'll walk right into your bathroom when you're using the bathroom if you don't lock the door. You know, you know what I'm saying? They don't care. They know they own the place. You're paying the bills, but they own the place. You may be on an important phone conversation, but with confidence, they walk right up into mama's lap. Why? Because they belong, and mom and daddy love them, and there's not any punishment coming from them wanting to crawl in the lap of mom or dad. So there's a confidence to going into the presence of the Lord. Not an arrogance, but a confidence. He wants, he wants you to approach him. See, any religion that makes you feel like you have no right to approach him is not, that's not Christianity, friend. Any religion that says only a couple people, only the ones on the stage, only the ones with a collar can approach him, nah. Any child of God can come in the room boldly and get in his presence. Amen, somebody. Do I pray for something once or repeatedly? I know I'm almost out of time. I will land where we'll land and we'll pick up next week, Okay. And the part of the Holy Spirit series is going to be next week. It just happened this way. Do I pray for something once or repeatedly? I go with repeatedly because of experience more than anything. Now, I was raised in the Word of Faith movement, and some of you still love the Word of Faith. More power to you. Word of Faith is you pray it, you believe it, it's done. Name it, and it's yours by faith. And they said, if you prayed here, and then you prayed again next week for it, then you must be doubting your first prayer. So it can't be a prayer of faith. Eh. Eh. You know, if it's working for you, whatever. At least thank God for answering what you've already prayed. At least do something. But I'm reminded of the passage, the parable that, Luke, that uh, God, Jesus taught the disciples in Luke. And he taught them about this, uh, this uh, widow who was trying to get justice in front of a judge who didn't like her. Y'all know this story? And he was ignoring her, and he didn't care about her case. And he says, I'm, no, denied. Get out of here. And she kept coming back day after day after day. She said, you can deny me today, but I'm coming back tomorrow. You can deny me tomorrow, but I'm coming back on Wednesday. I'm going to keep on knocking until finally he said, fine. Fine, just get out of my face. And Jesus said, not because he cared about God or people or her, just so she would shut up. 
That's the CSV, Chad Smith version. Just so she would shut up, he granted her request. And then Jesus juxtaposed the father with the judge. And he said, how much more will my father answer the request of his children when they, everybody say I'm listening, when they cry out day and night. Pray again, pray again, pray again, pray again, pray again, pray again. Oh goodness, my daughter came to church. Pray again, pray again. Oh goodness, the EKG showed something else. Pray again, pray again. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will knock, 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 knock and it will be opened to you. I'll lean toward praying until God answers. <laughs> then we have, uh, oh yeah, that's the one. I, I'm not going to have time to talk about Elijah, but when, when he prayed, <laughs> but here I am talking about Elijah. When he prayed for it to rain again, he prayed and asked his servant to go check the sky seven times before he saw a little cloud. You know what that means? He kept on praying until he saw evidence that it was being answered. Now, where we're going to have to land today is the next one, and I, I don't have time to preach it much, except I want you to mention it, the prayer of agreement. The prayer of agreement. And we're going to practice this on Tuesday, and I'll teach it again next Sunday because I'm not going to teach it for much time today. But there is a beautiful privilege of people of God that can have a prayer of agreement and Jesus said, again, I assure you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. I love that it doesn't take a church of 1,700 to agree on something. Thank God. We can't, churches can't agree on the color on the walls or the songs they sing, much less agree on one thing in prayer. I'm glad it doesn't take a board of 12 members to agree. He said, if two people get together on something in prayer. You know what I break that down to? The power of a husband and a wife. There have been times Danette and I have been going down the road and something would hit us and we would just grab our hands and we would say, we agree right now in Jesus' name. The Holy Spirit would drop in that pickup truck and he would hear our prayers. There is power in your marriage. If you'll stop bickering over money and who gets a new car and who disciplines the kids and start getting on the page of Jesus and the kingdom and doing things his way. And you grab and you touch that person's hand. That moment of agreement has power in heaven. Well, I'm a single mom. Do you have a teenage daughter that's saved? Grab that girl's hand on the way to school. Let's agree in prayer that God's going to move in your friend group, that God's going to change, that God's going to shift this prayer of agreement. And I can't explain it. God set it up to where if two people, and I know this is kingdom business. This is, this is a text when it's saying we're, we're in the church talking about kingdom business. So don't agree that God's going to give you a new boat. Let's agree that God's going to give a, me a new soft tail Harley. You're not, you're not praying for a part of Davidson or crotch rocket. Don't, don't cheapen the power of prayer to, to the trivial trappings and the shiny trinkets of this life. But when you're trying to break the strongholds off of your children, when you're trying to break through a healing in your body, grab that wife's hand, grab that husband's hand. Say, right now, let's storm heaven and, and agree. God says there's power in heaven for a couple who will do that. Amen, somebody. And, and I'm, I'm out of time. So i got to stop there. I'll pick up next week. But I want you to know, Tuesday, I'm going to teach on this five minutes, and we're going to put it into action, some straight-up action of prayer of agreement. To you. So if, if you can come with a saved friend or a spouse, bring it. It's going to be powerful. I'm going to give you a chance to do it right now, but I can't instruct too much more. I just want you to know, would you stand on your feet, everybody? Does anybody have a huge old prayer need right now? I mean, it's monster big, and you need God to move. Would you raise your hand? I'm, I'm just going to let you do it right where you're standing. Raise your hand. you got a need. You need God to move on. All right. Now listen. Well, first of all, first, hands, th thank you for your hands. Let me tell you there's one prayer that God never denies. There's a prayer he never denies. You guys come on down. That's fine. Start praying. When a sinner is touched by the Holy Spirit to know they need a Savior, he said... I will in no wise cast anybody out that comes to me. 
The one prayer, when, I, when somebody who needs salvation is moved by the Spirit to say, Lord, would you save me? He says, I'll answer it every single time. So online, I wish I could hold your hands right now and look in your face and say, do you need to pray that prayer? Anybody in this room, do you need to pray that prayer? I'm going to pray it right now. And you just, if you pray it, you'll raise your hand and we'll clap for you in a minute. But right now, if the Lord is moving you to pray that prayer, say, Jesus, I need a Savior. I need a God who hears me. And I need a God who forgives me. I, I'm tired of my life. I'm, I'm sorry for what I've done. I believe you're the cross is my answer. I believe your blood washing my heart clean is the answer. So I believe on you to be my Savior today. And only you. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Lord, as they're praying this, I pray online somebody's being saved. I pray in this room, in the overflow, somebody's saying yes to Jesus. Let it happen, Lord. The miracle that only you can do. Say, Lord, thank you for saving me. Jesus' name.